The first scene shows the opening of a national opera house in Kiev and the attack on it, which is referred to as the Kiev siege throughout the movie. We know that the date is the 14th because Neil will mention this later on in the movie when they're at Trondheim as the date that Sator was trying to steal a section of the algorithm from the American team in Ukraine. So Michael Crosby also tells the protagonist that there was a detonation at Stulsk 12 on the 14th, the same day as the Kiev siege. Remember Stulsk 12 is the Soviet era secret city somewhere in northwest Siberia. This is where Sator grew up and where he made his fortune from plutonium. The explosion that took place on the 14th was supposed to end the world. You see, it was Sator and the Future's mission to have him assemble all nine sections of an algorithm and bring them to a dead drop in the hypocenter at Stulse 12. The explosion does still happen, but by now we know that Team Tenet manages to lift the algorithm out of the dead drop in time, so it ends up not being end of play. Because 10 seems to be a kind of consistent number or theme in this movie, more on that later, it seems that if we follow the protagonist's point of view, all the events take place over the course of 10 days. Well, to be more specific, it's 10 days between the Kiev siege and that day at Trondheim, just before Neil, the protagonist, Ive and his red and blue teams embark on their temporal pincer movement to prevent the algorithm going into the dead drop. The most important thing to remember, and something that Christopher Nolan himself says, is that there is only one timeline throughout the movie. You see, a viewer had asked him how characters returned to their own timelines after traveling backwards, and this was his answer. Well, the question slightly misunderstands the rules. Their timeline is their timeline, and through the rules of inversion, it can be inverted, and they can move backwards through time. They can then reinvert using a turnstile and move forwards in time, but they will still continue to be on that timeline. The best way to think of it is if you follow the protagonist's experience through the story, that's a single timeline that you're following. But that timeline can move both forwards and backwards. It's quite distinct from time travel per se. They refer to the possibility of multiple realities, but the terms of the storyline are pretty tight. It's also really helpful to see some of Nolan's own diagrams and how he graphically depicts the inverse on a timeline. Also, the way the movie is presented to us already includes the moment that their future selves have reversed and made those changes. And we see this play out again in the present with the understanding that they can't change anything. What's happened's happened, as Neil likes to say. I don't know, it might have just been too easy or boring to have this set in the future and just have them go backwards. And then you also get the fun and interesting lines like when Neil says to the protagonist, you have a future in the past, years ago for me, years from now for you. Another interesting thing I found is that there's very little information on reinverting in this movie, and I guess that that's by design. This also makes it quite understandable why the audience member asks that question of how they get back, because it's not explicitly explained in the movie. So Nolan says that someone can also reinvert using the turnstile to move forward. We see this with the two antagonist versions of the protagonist in Oslo. One is moving forwards and the other is inverted moving backwards, both having come out of the turnstile. There's also this line in the transcript that didn't make it into the movie. In the movie, Priya tells the protagonist that the two antagonists were the same person. And then she says in the transcript, you saw someone reinverting. So reinverting just means to invert again. And yeah, we see that happening, but it's not explicitly mentioned. It's just kind of fun to know. I should mention though that the audience member's question, a really good one, is actually answered in the movie. So in Talon, when the protagonist wants to go into Sator's turnstile, Ive tells him that there's no way to bring the protagonist back because where will they find another turnstile? A week ago? Obviously, Neil and the protagonist tell him about the one in the Freeport in Oslo, but yeah, this tells us that people don't just go backwards in the turnstile and stay there. They need another turnstile to bring themselves back. Obviously, this isn't mentioned for Kate as well when she goes back to the 14th, but I mean, I'm just assuming that after she kills Sator, she goes back into the turnstile and it brings her back to the present point in the timeline, as in 10 days later. In the book, The Nolan Variations, Nolan himself also talks about how many ways John David Washington, who plays the protagonist, had to learn how to fight. As the protagonist moving forwards, throughout the majority of the movie, as the antagonist moving forwards that fought Neil, the protagonist backwards in Talon, and the antagonist backwards again in Oslo. He mentions also in the book that the number one rule was that they couldn't steal a shot from another part of the movie and simply reverse it. Everything had to be filmed anew. And this is why Washington had to learn to fight four different ways. If you are a Nolan fan, I'd highly recommend this book, by the way. 
Now on to question one. During Kat and the protagonist's first dinner, she references the yacht holiday in Vietnam that Sata had just forced them on. She talks about how she tried to love him again, he made her the offer to leave without her son, then she went ashore with Max, her son, and when she came back, she saw a woman, herself, diving off of the yacht and Sata had vanished. He flew off. So how is it that Sata is still alive after the 14th with Kat sitting at the table talking about him if she killed him on the yacht? Well, we know that two versions of a person can exist simultaneously. Future Kat in the bikini sees her past red dress self arrive back at the yacht after she killed Sata. Her past self also glimpses her future self diving off the yacht, but of course she doesn't know it's her. The same can be applied to Sata. Before Kat arrives on the yacht, we see a helicopter flying away from it. This is Sata going to Ukraine. It's the 14th, remember, so he's going to try and retrieve the final part of the algorithm. Future Cat arrives on the yacht to surprise him and she's told that he's just left. Well, yes, we saw that. Then Cat hears and sees a helicopter arrive and she knows that that's future Sata coming back because that's the golden moment that he chooses to end his life and the world. Quite sentimental for a brute. Now remember that Cat is able to catch him off guard because he shot her in Talon and being shot with an inverted bullet means certain death by a kind of reverse radiation. So Sata thinks that she's dead. Neil and the protagonist do save her though and until the moment she reveals her scar to Sata, he's under the impression that this is Red Dress Cat. It was helpful for me to understand that Red Dress Cat on the boat, past Cat, will still need to meet the protagonist and her events will be the ones that we see play out in the movie with Sata eventually shooting her, she heals and then she shoots Sata. These things still need to happen for Red Dress Cat, but we do eventually see how it all pans out for her, part of her future anyway, a life without Sata as we see that she walks home from school with her son. Now to the part of the movie that I probably should have started with, Neil and Tenet. We know that Tenet will be founded in the future, Priya tells the protagonist this. It's presumably founded by the protagonist himself. So I deduce this from the protagonist telling Priya that both he and Priya were working for him the whole time. And Neil tells the protagonist that he recruited him and that this whole temporal pincer movement is his, it's the protagonist. So even if he didn't found Tenet, he's at the top of the chain. Anyway, at some point in the future, Tenet is founded as a response to Sata and the future's plan to destroy the past. And this war can't just be fought in the future, obviously, but also in the past, around the time leading up to, including, and probably shortly after the 14th. This is the temporal pincer movement that Neil is referring to when he says the whole thing. Not just the pincer movement at Stealth 12 by Ives and the team, but fighting the whole war temporarily against the future in the future and in the past. Anyway, I guess in the movie we have this situation where the protagonist is kind of recruited into his own operation unbeknownst to him. In the future we can guess though that he likely founds Tenet, recruits Neil, they have their adventures, and at some point, Neil reverses, and he does a couple of things. He saves the protagonist's life during the Kiev siege. We know this because of the talisman on his backpack. Neil makes the introduction to Priya in Mumbai. He helps save Kat's life. And he also has a lot of useful information that is sometimes a little too convenient that it makes the protagonist suspicious of him. So Neil dies in Stolsk 12 while he's helping the splinter team retrieve the algorithm. Remember, Neil is on the blue team at first meaning the inverter team. Both the red team and the blue teams have a 10 minute countdown for this mission. The blue team starts at 10 minutes from the explosion and by zero, when the 10 minutes is up, they need to be at the landing zone for extraction. And it's obviously the opposite for the red team. The protagonist and I, the splinter unit, go to the tunnel and on the way in they trigger a tripwire which blows down the entrance of the tunnel so it collapses. Neil sees Volkov reverse exit out of the tunnel and that's how he knows that the two are going to need some help. Meanwhile inside the tunnel the protagonist and I see a body laying there with a blue armband so they know that it's someone from the inverted blue tenant team. Then the protagonist sees the orange talisman on his backpack. This is familiar to him because it's the same talisman on the backpack that helped him at the opera house. Obviously he doesn't know this now and neither do we really at this point in the movie, but this is inverted dead Neil. How do we know that? Well, we see that Neil goes inside the turnstile that's in the hypercenter. We see his inverted and reinverted cells come out. His forward self goes to the truck and remember he went into the turnstile so his forward self is at the moment just before the protagonist and Ive go into the tunnel before the entrance collapses. He's hooting at them trying to get them to wait but we saw already that they get in and trigger the tripwire. Back in the cage we see the inverted dead blue soldier wake up. He takes the bullet that both Sata and Volkov meant to shoot the protagonist with. So Neil's inverted self is shot by Volkov and the gate, 
that only Neil could open is opened. The protagonist and Volkov struggle then and inverted Neil keeps the gate open for Ive and then we see him close it and run backwards, inverted, out of the cage. The protagonist does overpower Volkov eventually and Ive confirms to Mahir that the tunnel is sealed and the gate is closed. Forward Neil, meanwhile, is at his truck pulling a rope out and in the tunnel the protagonist and Ive get word that Kat has already killed Sator. Luckily though they have the algorithm. Just then Neil's rope drops in and he's able to pull both the protagonist and Ive out with literal seconds to spare. By the way in the book The Nolan Variations Christopher Nolan says we try to make the movie palindromically correct. That is to say if somebody buys the DVD and watches it backwards it's consistent. It was actually only when I read this that I noticed that the title of the movie itself is also a palindrome. Really I never noticed it. It's 10, 10 backwards. And I originally thought that 10, it was mostly just a code word and a gesture to get access, a signal that you're in on it, secret handshake, if you will. And it is. Neil also uses the gesture to describe what happens the more objects become inverted, the intertwining of the two directions of time. It's also the name of the operation, which consists of two 10 minute operations moving backwards and forwards simultaneously. After Neil pulls Ive and the protagonist out, we get quite an interesting conversation between Neil and the protagonist. Neil says that the protagonist has a future in the past years ago for me, so for Neil. Neil has reversed years from the future back to the 14th, so indeed this has already happened for him. So you can imagine the current protagonist's future after the event of this movie where he'll go on to still experience the friendship with Neil. But we see that the protagonist does put it together that it was Neil who died in the cage because he sees the orange talisman on his backpack again as he asks if they could do things differently. Neil answers that what's happened's happened, but that's not an excuse to do nothing. So I sometimes wondered if maybe there was a chance that he was just wounded in the tunnel and not killed, but there's something about this interaction that has a finality to it, at least for now. Neil tells the protagonist to let him go and that this is the end of a beautiful friendship for him, obviously just the beginning for the protagonist. So what happens when a version of yourself dies just as Neil's inverted self died in the tunnel. Early in the movie, the protagonist asks him, what happens to Kat if Sata does kill her in the past? And Neil says that this is unknowable. If you're there to make a change, you're not there to observe its effect. Since she eventually does survive anyway, we don't really get to find out. In this case, Neil has reversed years, gone into a turnstile, and he gets shot in the past. Something similar happened with Sator. He went back to his golden moment and he gets shot and killed by Kat. We know that shortly thereafter, there is no more Sator. So yes, I do think that Neil is dead. And even though the protagonist knows that he still has a future with Neil, going on their big adventures, this fact doesn't change. Anyway, I'm going to end off by reading how Nolan talks about the really special friendship between the protagonist and Neil and how that final scene with Ive, Neil and the protagonist played out behind the scenes. If there's a love story in the movie, it's a love story between those guys. That's the emotional heart. And I didn't expect that. I set out to make it between the protagonist protagonist and Kat. That's the logical Fleming course, but neither myself nor John David felt the writing took us there. It just took me the way it took me and I found myself actually emotionally more invested in them. There's a very western flavour to it. A seven samurai kind of thing with guys splitting up and then it becomes this other thing. The crew was very into the scene. They don't normally pay attention. They don't normally express any kind of admiration for what the actors are doing, what's going on. We were on top of a mountain in the blazing sun with helicopters flying over. Usually when you have those moments with the crew, it's an intimate setting and actors doing something emotional. This was a lot more kind of extroverted, but all the actors, all three of them, were just fabulous in that moment. Everyone was buzzing. Anyway, that's it for this brief revisit of the movie Tenet. Thank you for watching.